Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andre, and today we'll be talking about our uh, Enterprise Chaos Engineering Certification Program. We'll be walking you through the course, what you can expect, what you can expect to learn, and how the um, how you might expect to be able to take the exam so that you can pass this course as best as possible. Um, just some quick housekeeping before we start. This webinar will be recorded. You'll get an email with the link to the recording once it's been processed and is ready for viewing. Um, and if you've already signed up for the course, that's awesome. Feel free to follow along in a separate browser window if you'd like. Um, but again, it's up to you and how you feel like following along. So again, welcome to today's prep session for the Enterprise Chaos Engineering Certification. I'm really excited to talk to you about this course, partially because I am put a lot of work into it, but also because um, we've seen a lot of really good results from it and a lot of great interest. So it's great to be able to share this with all of you. Um, today, I'll be covering the entire certification from top to bottom, including how to sign up, how to use our learning platform, different topics that you'll learn, and what you can expect from the exam at the end. So I'm sure you already know what the course is about, especially since you signed up for this webinar. But just in case, I'll do a quick overview. Um, this course covers the foundational concepts of chaos engineering, what it is, how it works, and how you can use it to improve reliability. Um, the course is focused on chaos engineering, of course. However, it is not a Gremlin-specific course. You'll see Gremlin used in a lot of examples, and of course, would encourage you to give Gremlin a try, but it's not a requirement for this course, and the information here is universal. Now, if you've been following Gremlin for a while, you probably know that we had two other certification courses. Um, this is a consolidation of those courses. We took the material from those and what we learned from feedback to make this comprehensive, all-encompassing course. So if you've taken those older certs and you have those older certs, that's fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you for doing so. Um, those certifications are not obsolete, but at the same time, this course is, is still worth taking. So I highly recommend taking this one as well. Um, our goal is by the end of this webinar, you'll have everything you need to be successful in taking the course, passing the exam, and most importantly, being able to take this uh, knowledge that you've gained and bring it to the own work that you're doing in your organization. Um, one last thing I will say is if you have any questions, we have a Q&A panel that you can drop them into at any time. I'll try to answer any important questions during the presentation, but we'll save a few minutes at the end to answer the rest, rest ah, to answer the rest. So with that preamble out of the way, let's just jump right into it. So if you haven't signed up for the course yet, you can see on the screen that I have our website open at gremlin.com slash certification. You can head right there, just click get certified, and that will bring you to a registration form that you can use to fill out. Once you click view now, you'll get a link to our education platform, CoAssemble, which is where you'll actually be taking the course. And uh, this is what that will look like once you get there. So. CoAssemble is a great platform. Um, the course is broken down into different modules. You can see that it'll track your progress. It'll also save your progress automatically so you can leave and come back at any time without having to worry about starting over. Um, so once you get that confirmation email, just hold on to it. If you do lose it and you do lose that link, feel free to reach out to us on our contact form on our Gremlin website. Or if you're a Gremlin customer, reach out to your account exec and we'll make sure that you can get back in there and get back to taking the course. All right, so jumping right into the course itself. Again, this is CoAssemble or Learning Platform. This is what you'll see once you've registered and logged in. I'll try not to read everything on the page because that'll be super boring, but I will go over the highlights. And again, you can follow along if you're already registered as well. So we just start with the course overview. Um, this course will teach you the foundational concepts behind chaos engineering and reliability testing. Uh, taking this course will teach you everything you need to know to practice cast engineering like a professional. I think I saw a comment in the chat panel where somebody was mentioning that um, they want to know if this course is for them. Uh, this section is for you. This course is designed for experienced engineers and even you know junior level engineers who are interested in learning more about cast engineering, who want to learn the principles of it, or who want to validate the cast engineering that you have. So. While you don't need to have taken any previous courses, we try to help you out from uh, from the very beginning. It does help if you have that engineering uh, experience. Um, and if you have experience with government or another chaos engineering tool, all the better, but it's not mandatory. So what can you expect to learn during this course? Um, a few of the topics are, of course, what chaos engineering is and how it applies to modern systems, what the different types of chaos engineering experiments are and their use cases, 
how to safely run experiments in different environments, including production, how to solve specific business and technical use cases with chaos engineering, common challenges, risks, and myths associated with it, and it's some additional details like what a scenario is, uh, what a game day is, and what a reliability test is, and how those help in your chaos engineering practice. And lastly, we'll touch a bit on, you know, once you've become familiar with chaos engineering, how do you introduce it to another team or to the rest of your organization? Um, so this course consists of six different learning modules, as you can see on the left hand side, and an exam at the end. Um, you will need to step through all six of those modules. Uh, we, as you can see, it records your progress through them. All these will need to be at 100%, um, even if you just click through them. But we do encourage taking your time and going through them slowly and just being able to you know, understand the concepts well. You will have an unlimited amount of time to go through the modules, but only 60 minutes to complete the exam, which is made up of 30 multiple choice questions. Uh, we do require a score of at least 80% to pass. However, um, some of the questions are multiple part and multi-select, and you will get partial points. So don't worry if you stumble on a few questions. Um, I believe you can have up to uh, six wrong answers. But again, we do get credit for partial questions. So don't worry too much if you uh, feel like you're missing some. Also, you can retake the exam up to three times. But so far, we've seen the average grade of that folks get to be around like 90%. So chances are you won't need to retake it. Uh, I won't say it's easy, but I will say that chances are you'll be able to pass it on your first try as long as you're you know, paying decent attention to the content. Um, one other disclaimer I do have to say, I know none of you would do this, but please don't discuss or share the specifics of the exam with others unless you both have taken it and passed it. Again, I'm not expecting anybody here to do that, but still, it's just a disclaimer I have to say. Last thing I will mention on the exam part for now, if you get stuck on a specific topic or you want to dive into more details, please feel free to open another browser tab or window and look stuff up. This course is really meant to test your understanding, not your memory. So as long as you understand the concepts and how they apply, that's really what matters. Um, I will, of course, point you to a ton of resources that we have on Grumman.com. If you head to Grumman.com slash resources, you can look through all of our blog posts, all of our tutorials, all of um, our different pieces of content that we published based on topic. So by all means, feel free to dive through here. There's a ton of great material. I'm a little biased because a lot of it's material that I made, but at the same time, you'll be able to find pretty much whatever you might wanna know um, about the certification through this page. All right, cool. Um, I'll take a quick second to answer some questions. Yes, the session will be recorded and will be replayable. Um, and also the uh, materials that are you know, available in the course will have links as well. So let's say if you're in the course and you want some additional references and additional materials, um, you can always come to the overview page and then click on these links here to be able to access those. Cool. So um, let's just jump right into it. So starting with the very first section, this is where we introduce chaos engineering, what the topic is, and um, what you can expect it to be. The main highlight is this first sentence here. Chaos engineering is the practice of running thoughtful planned experiments to identify hidden reliability risks in systems. Uh, first and foremost, chaos engineering is a practice. Is it, it isn't like a one-time thing or a, um, a type of technology. It's something that you do on a recurring basis. Um, the goal, of course, is to make your systems more reliable. And so the way we do that is by injecting faults into systems. Faults can include things like uh, consuming CPU, adding latency to network connections, or even losing dependencies. By doing so, we observe how our systems react to those faults, and then we use that knowledge to make our systems more reliable. Right? We identify the reasons why those faults caused our systems to behave the way they did. We address those systems. We maybe implement fixes or corrections so that they're no longer susceptible to that fault. And that makes our systems more resilient. So why is chaos engineering necessary? What did it come from? Or where did it come from, rather? The main thing is that, you know, we've seen software development change a lot over the past 10 to 20 years. You know, in the past, we had deployed software and servers as these big monoliths that didn't really change. Today, of course, we have microservices and containers that are constantly being deployed, updated, and scaled. 
And on top of that, software development as practice has gotten a lot faster too. Some teams deploy many times a day as opposed to maybe once a week or even once a quarter in the uh, good old monolith days, the waterfall days. Um, so we have to deal with that increasing pace of software development and also these um, new models of deploying software too that can introduce all sorts of new faults that we might not have been uh, anticipating or expecting coming from monolithic systems. So jumping into some common misconceptions about chaos engineering, um, these are very common. We hear these a lot, and you know it's totally understandable why these would be misconceptions, but it's still important to just clear them up. Um, first is that no chaos engineering is not about creating chaos. It's true that injecting fault can potentially cause problems if you're not careful, but that's why we build experiments and have chaos engineering experiments. Um, and tools that can safely revert any undesired impact caused by an injecting fault. The goal ultimately is to reduce chaos. So that's what we're driving towards more than anything. Second is that no chaos engineering is not unsafe. The practice itself, the reason it's designed as a practice is to be as safe as possible, which is why we have different recommendations for getting started and being careful and having the right tools. Third is that you can actually do chaos engineering without impacting your customer base, even in production. I know it's a big claim, so let me clarify. We recommend starting out in pre-production, and then as you eventually do migrate testing to production, because of course there's no environment like prod, use different deployment techniques like canary deployments or donk launches to control how many customers are exposed to your experiments. And lastly, depending on the tool, stopping or running an experiment can be as easy as one click or as running a single command. So as long as an experiment isn't one way, like shutting down or restarting the server, it can be stopped and reverted. You'll just need to double check on the tooling. All right, so I'm just gonna head on straight into our next section. I do see some questions coming in. I promise I'll get to those later. Uh, just bear with me for now. So we have a section on how chaos engineering works, and this really walks you through what the practice looks like um, you know, if, as if you're an engineer doing it yourself. So again, I mentioned that chaos engineering involves injecting fault. That is the main thing that we're gonna be focusing on. Uh, one thing I do wanna say is that chaos engineering isn't about causing random failures just to see what happens. Again, we do it deliberately and methodically, and we intentionally outline it as a five-step process. So if you've taken, you know, uh, middle school or high school science, this probably looks very familiar to you. This is a scientific process. And we follow a very similar thing with chaos engineering. Um, first is creating your hypothesis. How do you expect your system to respond to a certain type of fault injection? Next is defining your experiment. What can you do to test that hypothesis? What types of fault can you inject? Um, this even includes how long will you inject that fault for and how, um, uh, how the magnitude essentially of the fault. Next is of course, observing your system. Um, before you understand, or before you even run the experiment, it's important to observe your system beforehand to get its baseline behavior. Um, you'll need that to compare the results against after you run your uh, fault injection. So this way you know how the fault actually impacts your system and you can create that, um, that difference uh, to be able to you know, better uh, understand how to fix the issue. Now, you don't need a full observability practice in place, but at least we recommend monitoring Google's four golden signals of latency, throughput, resource saturation, and error rate. Um, we'll be diving into that a bit more later on. Again, most importantly, run the experiment, watch your systems to see how they react, and then use those observations to make improvements. And then, even more importantly, once you've done that and you've made your improvements and you've deployed your fixes, you want to repeat this process to make sure those improvements actually fix the issue. If they do, you can tweak your experiment a little bit, try something a little different, maybe increase the intensity of the experiment or target more um, uh, more nodes, and then you know uh, iteratively make those fixes so that your systems become a bit more reliable over time. You really don't want to start off trying to test everything all at once and trying to do 100 things all at once because then it's really hard to pinpoint where you can make your fixes. So start small and build up over time. Um, in this section, we have an example showing how to use this with a uh, simple um, web application that uses a MariaDB database. We walk through what it'd be like if you um, disconnected that web application from its database 
And as you can see, it's not great. You end up just getting this blank screen. Um, we go into more detail, of course. I don't want to spend too much time here on this particular page during this webinar, but this is a really good example to look at if you want to see an example of a chaos experiment in action. So definitely recommend checking that out. The last thing I want to cover in this section is abort conditions. Again, chaos engineering is experimental. It doesn't always go right. It's helpful to have an escape plan, and abort conditions are those escape plan. Um, what they are are there system conditions that tell you when you should stop an experiment, plain and simple. So for example, imagine if uh, we had done an experiment on that database with our web application, but somehow, instead of just getting a blank screen, it caused the web application to pat or crash or throw up an error message, or hopefully not throw up like a stack trace or something that the users could see. Uh, that would be an example of a poor condition. Is something unexpected that happened? We really don't want it to happen. So we want to be able to hit that halt button, hit that stop button in our experiment, and be able to revert our system back to normal. Um, so some other examples of abort conditions that aren't that extreme are, let's say an experiment causes a system to crash or restart, or if we lose network connection entirely to the test system so we can no longer monitor it, or let's say we have metrics like SLIs, SLAs, or SLOs in place, and we exceed them, especially in production environment, we also want that to be in abort conditions so that we don't exceed them for too long. In tools like Gremlin is where this becomes really helpful because while you can uh, manually look at your systems to see how their status is and just have your you know mouse cursor over the stop button, it's better if you have these automated for you. So Gremlin has a system called Health Checks that automates abort conditions by monitoring your systems through your observability tool. Other tools have have um, um, features just like this. It's just important to be aware of them and be able to take the time to learn how they work before you start running uh, larger scale experiments. So this next section is where we introduce the different experiment types. Um, every different chaos engineering tool has its own set of experiments that they represent. Uh, we have 13. As long as you understand the basics of what each experiment is trying to accomplish and how it works, that's the main thing. Um, just keep in mind that these might vary depending on which tool that you're using. Um, so for Gremlin, we have three different categories of experiments, state, resource, and network. Um, these are pretty self-explanatory. State experiments change the way the system works, such as its system clock or whether it's running or rebooting. These include being able to run a shutdown experiment, which as the name implies, shuts down or reboots the host. Um, if you're familiar with Chaos Monkey, this is essentially our version of Chaos Monkey. Um, time travel changes the host system time, so you can test things like security related, especially process killer, terminate specific processes, and so on. Resource, if you want to see how your systems respond when CPU or memory or disk space is exhausted, this is the type of test that you want to run. And then for network, if you want to introduce latency, if you want to completely disconnect a uh, system or service from another system, if you want to see, um, if you want to inject packet loss or packet jitter or packet corruption, or even if you want to test your TLS certificates to see if they're expiring soon, this is the category of, um, I'm sorry, category of experiment that you'd want to use. And of course, we make these each of these experiment types customizable. So for example, for almost all of experiments, you can specify the duration, how long it runs for, uh, how significant it is, and the blast radius or the number of systems that it will impact. You can also set some specific um, experiment specific options. So for example, um, if you're running a network attack experiment rather, you'll be able to choose, um, of course, I don't have the, there we go. You'll be able to specify how long the experiment runs for, um, in the case of latency, how much latency to add in milliseconds. You can also customize what types of traffic it targets, uh, which host names, what ports, and so on. Um, we also try to make it easy to target things like an entire AWS region. So if you want to add, if you want to simulate latency for a region, you would go to providers and select your region here. Uh, but again, a lot of tools have something very similar where you can just customize the experiment to best suit your needs. And this is really how you control, not just how uh, big the experiment is, but also how intense it is as well. So again, start small, focus on just one target at first, 
um, just add a short amount of time and a short amount of latency. And once you get comfortable, start uh, expanding that so you get a better um, a test of your systems. So we do have a few resources that go a bit deeper into experiments. Um, one thing I will point you to quickly is we have an entire ebook on each of Grumman's, dif each of Grumman's different experiment types. Um, if you want to dive deep into them and understand the specific use cases more that's in the certification, this is definitely the ebook for you. So I highly recommend going there and taking a look. It's not recommended for this exam or it's not required rather. Uh, it is recommended, but it does dive deeper into the experiment types and how you might use them. All right, so next up is scenarios. You can think of scenarios kind of as experiment workflows, right? They let you run multiple experiments sequentially. These are great for testing more complicated failure conditions like cascading failures, or if you're trying to reproduce a real world incident, think about something like a, um, a data center outage where you might have one node that goes down, two nodes, an entire rack, and then an entire zone. Scenarios can let you uh, reproduce like a situation like that. Um, scenarios also serve another important role in Gremlin. If you remember those health checks that I mentioned earlier that help you set your abort conditions, scenarios support health checks natively. So if you're running an experiment and you want that abort condition, that automatic way out, uh, scenario is the way to go. And of course, there's a bit more detail here and some more instructions on how you can set that up in Gremlin. Um, we don't have the time to go deeply into this right now, but just be aware that it is there. So next up is game days. Um, up to this point, pretty much everything we covered can be done individually. Game days are a little different because they involve multiple people, ideally an entire team. So imagine that we have a scenario that tests something big, like a cascading system failure. In that case, we don't just want to know how our systems react. We want to be able to test our incident response processes, our observability tools, maybe our alerting practices, and some other systems as well. This isn't something that a single individual engineer can do. It's a team-wide event, and so we need to treat it as such. And that's what game days are for. Game days are basically just a time or date that we set aside to run one or more experiments as a team. We run experiments, observe the impact, and discuss the outcomes in real time. Grumman does natively support game days. We have a game day feature that lets you organize all this in the product. And this screenshot just shows you what that might look like. So you see, we have a name for it. In this case, we're testing how our front end auto scales. We can include a goal about what we expect the outcome of this game day to be. Uh, we can say what environment we're running it in. Importantly, we can link to important resources like any dashboards or uh, run books that we want to have on hand. We can list participants, like the people who are involved in this game day. And then of course we have the scenarios that we wanna test as part of this game day. So it's basically a chance for teams to get together, run through a set of scenarios, and then um, discuss your learnings and the outcomes. And as a team, figure out how you can make your experiments or rather uh, your systems more resilient. So definitely as your team gets more familiar with chaos engineering, and wants to take a more active role in doing this type of testing, game days are the best way to do that because they give you that sort of uh, camaraderie in getting the entire team together to be able to run through this and learn from it together. So last in chaos experiment types is automation. Once you know how to run experiments and scenarios and game days, you can automate reliability tests much like you'd automate QA tests. Now in Gremlin, we call these reliability tests um, in Gremlin, if you go in and you click on services, you'll be able to see all of your different services as well as tests that we automatically generated. Um, these are pre-built. You can run on your service at one click, but they are based off of the same fault injection principle as um, regular chaos engineering experiments. So the reason that we designed this this way is for a few reasons. Um, first is that a lot of chaos engineers aren't really sure what to test for at first. Uh, this definitely isn't a problem. This isn't anything against those engineers. It's just that chaos engineering is a fairly broad and can be a little um, disorienting when you're just starting out. So this is just to give you that guidance on what to test first. And also, instead of having different teams creating their own separate experiments and scenarios and so forth, this standardized testing by giving everyone the same baseline test to run 
Um, so as you can see, we have these different tests for CPU, memory scalability, redundancy, even dependency. So if your services communicate with different downstream dependencies, um, you'll be able to run a failure test, like what happens if you get disconnected, latency tests, and that certificate expiry test I mentioned earlier. So all of these are also how we calculate this reliability score that tell you essentially in a nutshell um, how reliable that system is and how resilient it is to these different test types. So that's another reason why we have these P-Boat reliability tests. And also it scales with your system. So let's say um, this auto scheduling test service is in three different zones. If we increase that to two different regions, we can run these tests and it will still impact them all the same. So it just makes building and running those tests a bit easier. Uh, again, these are based off of the same fundamental uh, fault injection concepts as chaos engineering experiments. So as long as you understand that, you'll understand exactly how these are working. Uh, the difference is just usability and how we uh, present them. I know we're moving quickly. I promise I'll get to your Q&A questions later, uh, but I just want to make sure that we get through this section first. So once you've gone through learning how chaos engineering works, maybe you've practiced a game day or two, what's next, right? How do you take your knowledge and actually um, bring it back to your organization and bring it back to the real world? The first is literally just scaling the practice, right? Going from individual small experiments on a handful of systems to running these experiments across all of your applications, systems, and services, and even in production. A recommendation when you're bringing this to an engineering team is to start with a team that already understands reliability and has observability and incident response processes in place. Teams that are in charge of like websites or front end web applications likely have a lot of experience with this. So that's a great place to start. Again, start simple, start small, maybe add a little bit of latency or consume CPU on one host or shut down a single node that you know isn't critical to be able to uh, test your conditions. After you've gotten comfortable with that, Start running those game days to help the team practice incident response and keep your runbooks up to date. And of course, use your learnings from this team to be able to get other teams interested and in, um, educated on chaos engineering and hopefully on board with running their own tests. This section is a little scary, moving chaos engineering and production. So the big question you probably have here is why? Why would you run these tests in production? The main reason is that Pre-production is never the same as production. Production is its own unique thing, and you can try really hard to create a replication or replica of it, but it's almost impossible. Um, so, in order to get the most accurate results and be able to make the biggest changes, it's really important to run these experiments in production and get those results from production. Um, this is really a big part of why we have this experiment. Um, um, sort of layout in place for uh, chaos engineering because you really need that control when you're in production. Again, start with those small scale tests. Definitely define your abort conditions and health checks so that you have that escape button. Uh, and even if you're still uncomfortable running tests directly in production, you can use partial deployment methods like canary deployments, blue green, or dark launches so that you limit it to a specific percentage of production traffic and not you know everything. Eventually, you do want to move into prod and be able to run tests across your environment. That'll give you the best bang for your buck. But I understand it's scary. I understand it's hard to get buy-in for that. This is why you take the time to really understand how this practice works and uh, learn it well before you can be able to do that. Another part we see people, or rather um, a lot of engineers tend to have trouble with is getting buy-in. It's really hard getting people bought in. Trust me, we've been doing this for, for many years. Um, we've seen all sorts of pushback and reasons why folks don't do chaos engineering. And when you start advocating for this, it can be really hard to get it across. And the thing is, people tend to like the idea of chaos engineering, but they don't think it's something they can do or make time for, or they can't accept the risk of something going wrong. This is where it helps to have a champion, which is somebody who can really drive adoption in your organization. Champion is a person who really understands how chaos engineering works. They're really familiar with a tool or with multiple tools even, and they can sort of present the benefits to their organization and help drum up that interest. Um, if you want to increase chaos engineering usage in your organization, you should definitely become a champion. And the certification is a great step towards doing so because it shows that you know your stuff and that you can um, 
you really understand what's involved and what the benefits are. Right. And last thing I want to cover before we get to the exam part is how do you measure progress? How do you show that all of this work that you're doing, all this training, all this practice is actually having a benefit? If you remember way back, I mentioned key metrics like SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs. That's the best place to start, right? Look for improvements and metrics that are most important to you and your organization that came as a result of all this work that you're doing. If you can, link those to the bigger key business metrics or key performance indicators like revenue saved, cost reduced, um, customers retained, and of course, less stress on your engineering teams because they no longer have to respond to incidents or outages like they did before. And show off to your manager, right? Show that your reliability work is having a uh, valuable contribution and is making an improvement and that you know, your scores are high and you're covering all your systems and that you're really focused on resiliency. And of course, don't forget to waive your uh, certification just to show that you do know your stuff. All right, so I know we're running a bit low on time. I'll try to walk through the exam fairly quickly. Um, I can't show you the full exam, but I can show you generally what it looks like. So again, there are 30 questions. You can see all of them on the list on the left-hand side. Um, you'll be able to go through each question one at a time. Most of them are multiple choice like this. So when you see a question like this, you just click on the answer that you think is correct and click next. You won't get immediate feedback, but it does save your answer, trust me. So you can just continue taking the test this way. Um, for questions that are split into multiple parts like this one, we do give partial credit. So just again, select the answers that you think is correct. Even if you're not 100% sure, just go with your gut, think of what sounds the best. Uh, you can have another browser window open if you'd like, but again, we only offer 60 minutes for the test. So that's only two uh, minutes per question. So try not to take too much time um, on, each, uh, on each question before clicking next. One other thing I will show you is that some questions do require you to rearrange answers like this one. So in this case, we're going step-by-step step over how to structure a scenario to test for a specific use case. Um, here you would simply drag and drop each step to try and get it in the order that you think is correct. And once you think you have it in the correct order, just click next and again, it'll save your question and you can move on to the next one. Then once you get to the end, you get to the results screen and it will show you um, your final score, whether you passed or not. And if you didn't pass, um, how to retake the test. Again, you have three chances to retake it, but as long as you get 80% or higher, you'll have passed the test. And we use a different platform for our certifications called Accredible. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a tab open to show you what that looks like, but your final certification will come from Accredible with your new certification. Um, you'll get an email as well as a link to uh, uh, the certification on Accredible's website. From there, you can send it out to LinkedIn or post it on your profile or whatever you like and definitely be able to show it off from there. So I know that was a fast run through. I know that's kind of condensed, but I hope this at least makes you feel a bit more comfortable approaching this course, knowing what it entails and uh, what the exam will look like once you actually get to that point. And so I see we have a few questions that came in over Q&A. I'll try to go through these as I can. Uh, we also have a few questions in chat, but I'll start with the Q&A ones first. Again, if you do have a question, just head over to that Q&A panel and enter them there. All right, so here's a great one. How oriented is the, oops, I just lost it. <laughs> there we go. How oriented is the exam between chaos engineering as a practice and the Gremlin tool? So this exam was built focused on chaos engineering as a practice. There are some areas that you saw where we include like Gremlin screenshots, especially regarding um, experiments. Those are really just for, um, uh, just to show you what this would look like in a tool. So yes, it is the Gremlin specific tool, but we try to make these practices as universal as possible. So you should be able to take these to any other tool or wherever else you might go. So hopefully that answers your question. Another good one, is this certification different from the GCC ePro? 
So again, if you're unfamiliar, um, the GCC ePro was the previous certification that we offered as well as the GCC EP. This is, it is a different certification, but it uses a lot of the same fundamental concepts. Um, it just presents them in a different way and combines them with some more information that we've, you know, and some more of our learnings that we've developed since we released those certifications. So it is different, um, doesn't render your old ones obsolete, but nonetheless, we do recommend taking this new one just so that you can keep your, um, you know, your certification up to date. Oh, here's a very good one. Is it still necessary to do production-based tests, though we have the equivalent pre-production environment? And also, how do you convince the project stakeholders for doing tests directly in production? So I'll start with the first one. I will say yes, unless your pre-production environment is exactly the same as production, like same systems or same architecture, same traffic. Um, the reason for that is, again, because production is unique. Uh, it's really hard to get the same results in pre-production if it doesn't exactly match production one-to-one. -one. Um, but that's also why we recommend starting small. So starting pre-production, get familiar with those experiments, get your scenarios designed, try them out. And then as you show that you're, you know, you've got your controls in place and you feel confident running those scenarios, then you can slowly migrate them over to production. Um, the exception that I will say, and this might be your situation, is if you're using a deployment methodology like um, AB environments or canary deployments, where you're able to route a small amount of production traffic to like a different system, um, that's a really good way to control also um, being able to run controlled experiments in production. As far as convincing project stakeholders, um, it really comes down to showing that you have everything in place to be able to stop that experiment if necessary, um, that you've thought out how you're going to be running these tests, um, and that you're starting out targeting just a smaller subset of systems. Again, if you can only target a small percentage of that production traffic, that's a great way to um, you know, alleviate that fear of accidentally taking down your entire production environment, for example. So that's typically what, what we recommend. Another good one is, does the certification require AWS? And how familiar must you be with using AWS? You don't need to have any AWS experience when taking this. Um, all of this is cloud agnostic. So if you're running on Google, Azure, AWS, it doesn't really matter. Um, this will be equally applicable. Uh, let's see. How can Gremlin be used on game days for cloud-based CAS engineering? For example, dealing directly with Google Cloud Engineering Pod or Google Kubernetes Engine, sorry, pods, uh, Docker, et cetera. So Gremlin natively supports um, all Kubernetes clusters as well as containers. So if you're using Gremlin, doesn't matter if you're using uh, Google Kubernetes or Azure Kubernetes or AKS, or rather, EKS, sorry, I got my acronyms mixed up. Um, you'll be able to run it all the same. Um, as an example, I've got my own Gremlin environment here. Um, I've got it running on a Kubernetes cluster. So if I wanted to create a new experiment, I could just go to Kubernetes um, and then select my specific deployments or um, you know pods or whatever it might be from here. Um, so Gremlin specifically is cloud agnostic. If you're using a different tool, it might be different. But um, generally, it doesn't matter which cloud environment that you're using if you're trying it out with Gremlin. Let's see. Oh, a link to the course. Um, if you want to sign up for the course, again, just head over to gremlin.com slash certification. I'll actually drop that into chat now. You can sign up for free. All you have to do is fill out this form and click view now, and we'll shoot you an email with a link to uh, register for the course in CoAssemble. Another question of, does Gremlin offer a free tier or trial version? We offer a free 30-day trial. So if you go to our website and then click on get started, 
you'll be able to sign up for your free 30 day trial here. And that'll be more than enough to be able to walk through this course and understand how the tool works and just get familiar, just get more familiar with grass engineering rather. And last in the Q and A pane is how can Gremlin help with, uh, I keep losing these questions, I'm sorry, transitioning to SRE. That's kind of a loaded question, but what I will uh, recommend is we have material on site reliability engineering. Talks a bit more about the role itself, what it means, but we do talk a bit about how chaos engineering fits into it. So if you would like to learn more about that, I will drop a link to that as well. I would say there is nothing specific on SRE in the certification program, but at the same time, if you are an, SNE, uh, an SRE already, you might find this information useful. So I recommend checking it out all the same. Great questions. Just scanning chat quickly to see if we have anything else to cover. So we have one that is what is considered to be an ideal reliability score for a service. It does it have any relation with SLA and SLO? Oh, sorry, I just see you reposted that. Um, Simply put, an ideal is 100. Like the highest you can get it, the better. Um, I've just finished adding a few services here, and my scores are pathetic, as you can see. Um, that just means that I failed a lot of tests. My systems aren't that reliable. But the higher you can get this, the better. And you do that by you know turning all of these red failed results into past results. Um, you know, in the case of services, you can come in here, add your service. This is just a Kubernetes service that I added automatically. Um, and then click run all, let German go through the reliability test and based off of its results, you'll get your score back. And while it isn't directly related to SLA and SLO, you can actually connect those. And the way you would do that is with your health checks. So for this service, I have a health check where all it does is it checks my um, the website front end to see if it's available or not. If so, then the test passes and if not, it fails. But you can add health checks from, uh, if I can find a good example, from different observability tools like Datadog, PagerDuty, New Relic. So if you have your SLOs or SLAs defined anywhere in here, you can just point Gremlin to that, um, that metric and it will keep an eye on that for you. And if it goes past a certain value or if reports back is unhealthy or whatever it might be, um, that will be interpreted by Gremlin as a failure. So yeah, the way you would do it is by adding in health checks. Ooh, lots of great questions. Let's see. There's one here in the chat. Chaos engineering sounds like a cooler term for testing as the objective of testing is to identify project and product risks and help develop a mitigation strategy. Does that sound right? Yes, on both counts. Uh, chaos engineering is a cool term. It was deliberately designed that way to be a little bit um, a little bit snarky in a sense. Um, again, that's just a good, you know, good reminder that chaos engineering isn't about creating chaos, but rather mitigating it. So we are trying to find those risks in your system, specifically reliability risks. And chaos engineering is the practice of essentially not just uncovering those risks, but also being able to test our fixes against them. So you find those risks, you try to develop a mitigation strategy, you would implement fixes, push code, um, scale up your systems, whatever it might be. And then you can use chaos engineering again to make sure that your um, um, you're resilient to those risks, that those risks are no longer part of these systems. So yes, on both counts. Uh, can a reliability score be used for a BCP certification? Sorry, I have, I'm going to assume BCP stands for business continuity. I can't really say it can be used directly, but I'm also not that familiar with business continuity practices, so I can't say for sure. Um, in general, what the score represents is 
you know, of the different tests that are important for your systems to be able to keep those systems up and running, this is how well your um, service adheres to those requirements. So these are the requirements that we built out for this service and for all of the services in Gremlin. Um, I was only able to, you know, successfully pass one of them. The rest of them I got a little bit of credit for because I did run the test even though I failed, which is why it's at 50% and not like 10 or 15%. Um, but if you're able to adhere to all of these and successfully pass all of them, that's where you get 100. So, you know, if your requirement is to have all your services be 100% reliable or even 90% reliable, you could theoretically use this to be able to, um, you know, to test your adherence to that. Let's see, oh, this is a big one. Uh, how well does Grumman integrate with performance testing tools like LRE, JMeter, NeoLoad, Gatling, and so on? We do actually allow you to integrate directly with some tools as well as integrate um, custom toolings. So for example, if I went to, for this particular service, um, you can set it up elsewhere, but if I went to integrations, we do allow you to add load generators. Uh, right now we only support Grafana Cloud, but if you have a custom one that you wanna use, you can click other. And you will set this up just like you would any other um, um, webhook or health check. So you can enter a name for whatever your tool is, the endpoints that you wanna send that request to, that, you know, for example, this will tell you, how, or this will send a request to start a test. Um, you can send requests to check a test while it's running to make sure that it's still running during the experiment and so on. Um, so again, right now we only support Grafana Cloud directly, but you can use pretty much any tool that supports um, uh, REST API requests. Cool. And yeah, if you did join late, the link to go to is gremlin.com slash certification. Click on the uh, certified button. That'll bring you down to this form. Just fill out this form and then we'll send you a link to the course to where you can get started. And the course has all the information that you need to, um, to be prepared for the exam. So like, as you go through, we have a lot of content that dives a bit deeper into the, each of these subjects. And we also do have a handful of links that you can use. So if you wanna find more information, um, we offer a few links to like documentation, to videos and so on. It's also just good old Google. Like if you do a Google search, chances are you'll find the information you need. Um, but this is a good place to go to uh, get all that stuff accessible right away. And uh, yes, this qu uh, session will be recorded. The recording will be made available takes a little while after the webinar ends to process, but you'll get an email with a link to the recording. So you can definitely refer back to this. Right. Awesome. Now well, we're coming up on time. Um, I don't see any more questions coming through. If you do see, or sorry, if you do think of questions after the webinar ends, you can always come to gremlin.com slash contact to get in touch with us. Feel free to, you know, Fill out this form if you have any additional questions, um, and we'll get in touch with you as soon as we can. I just saw one more question pop up. This is a good one. What's coming next after the uh, Enterprise Cast Engineering certif Certification? Best I can say right now is stay tuned. We've definitely got thoughts mulling around about what to bring up next. Uh, and as if we do develop another course, we'll definitely let you all know. So just stay tuned for that. Uh, in the meantime, though, I think we can wrap up this session. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, definitely hope that this webinar was useful for you all. Uh, just to repeat again, there will be a recording made available. You can head over to gummin.com slash certification to sign up and get started. The uh, certification course has all the information that you need to be able to successfully pass the exam. You will have 60 minutes to take it. So you know, don't get hung up on any particular questions. Just go with your gut if you're not sure about a question. And um, yeah, definitely hope you see success. And if you're worried about it, don't be. What we've seen, most people tend to pass with a 90% score. 
So as long as you're just paying attention and being thoughtful and you know going through the course at your own pace, you'll do it just fine. Awesome. Oh, again, thanks you all so much for joining. Um, hope this was educational for you and good luck as you take the course. And uh, thanks for spending time with me today.